So the collection actually has a pretty long history. Um, people began collecting algae and putting them in, in culture uh, around 1900 or so, right around the first part of the 20th century. And the father of this collection was a man named Ernst Pringsheim. Uh, he was a German uh, PhD who uh, started one of the first collections of algae. And he was actually in Prague uh, during the, the most part of his career. Uh, when World War II began, uh, it turns out that you know, Pringsheim was Jewish. And in order to escape the Nazis, he left and went to the UK and took his algae collection with him, about 400 different cultures of algae. And it was there that he met the uh, founder of this collection. Uh, his name is Richard Starr. They were, they were collaborators at Cambridge University. So uh, these cultures, uh, many of them, about 400 of them anyway, have been, are well-traveled. Uh, and we have some still in collection that were, that have been in, in culture since before 1900, so. This collection is important for a number of reasons, and I think I'd like to start by pointing out how important algae are in general. Okay, so most of the time when people think of algae, they think of pond scum, they think of the things that are a problem for their aquarium or their swimming pool. But in fact, uh, algae uh, make 50% of the oxygen that we breathe, so every other breath you can thank algae for. Uh, they're also enormously important for cycling nutrients, particularly nitrogen and sulfur through the environment. So they are hugely ecologically important. Uh, they also form symbiotic relationships that we find important because uh, coral are dependent on a symbiotic relationship with algae, one called zooxanthellae. So without algae, there's no coral, there are no coral reefs, and the oceans become a desert. They are a central focus of research for renewable fuels, for biofuels, for biodiesel in particular. Uh, there are a number of commercial aspects that they make products like astaxanthin, which is a health product. Uh, people grow spirulina, which is a cyanobacterium on a large scale as a, a nutraceutical product. Uh, they are also uh, an untapped resource for bioactive compounds. And these are compounds that can be antibiotics or they can also be antimicrobial, I mean, excuse me, um, anti-cancer compounds. So, they're an enormous resource for that, and they're, we're really just on the cusp of starting to understand what they, how they can be used in that direction. The collection that we have here has more genetic and biochemical biodiversity than any collection of animals in you know, any zoo, or any botanical garden in the world, just housed in this one building. And we are able then to distribute this biodiversity to researchers and educators all over the world, and they can then replicate each other's experiments knowing that they have exactly the same sort of alga that other people have used. And that is really our function. That is what we do, and that's why we are important.